Uh, if you have your Bible, open up to the book of Mark, chapter 1. Mark, chapter 1. We are diving into a new series uh, through the Gospel of Mark. We're going to work through Mark in order. We're going to start at 1-1 one, one today uh, and just go until we uh, finish it. We may take some breaks along the way uh, to look at some other topics, but um, for the foreseeable future, we're going to look at the Gospel of Mark. I, I thought I'd take a little bit of time to introduce the book, uh, to kind of give some background. It's always a good idea to know what you're reading and kind of what the story is and uh, what's going on there. The Gospel of Mark is one of four Gospels, as you probably know. There's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in your, in your Bible. Uh, but Mark, most scholars believe, was written first. It was the earliest written of all of the Gospels. And uh, it's, a, it's a fast-paced book. It's uh, 16 chapters long, and it goes quickly. It's very action-oriented. There's uh, not as much dialogue as you're going to find in some of the other Gospels. There's not as much uh, Old Testament Bible quotations as you're going to find uh, in the other uh, Gospels. This is primarily because um, the, this gospel was written for Roman Gentiles more than it was written for Jews like Matthew would have been. Um, it's, a, uh, it's divided, the book's divided roughly into two parts. There's 16 chapters, like I said, and the first eight chapters are kind of this uh, journey, this, this, or the, Jesus' ministry in the Galilee region, in the northern part of Israel, around the Sea of Galilee. It tells the story of his ministry up there. And then the second half of the book, chapters, uh, the second half, chapter 8, verse all the way through the end of 16, is the story of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem and then what ultimately happens with his uh, crucifixion and uh, resurrection in Jerusalem. And so there's kind of the Galilee uh, ministry is the first half, first eight chapters, and then the journey to Jerusalem is the second half of the book. And so that's a convenient way. It helps us to kind of understand what's uh, going on here. Uh, the Gospel of Mark is a fascinating tale. I love this graphic that um, uh, Kelsey's put together for us. It kind of shows this path winding uh, from down, from low, up, this, up to this mountain, which is a great illustration of how the book of Mark works. Jesus moves from the Galilee region, which geographically is lower. It's north, but it's lower uh, uh, on, the, on the map topographically. Uh, and then they go up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is kind of on a hill, and so there's this journey from Galilee to Jerusalem that we're going to follow Jesus on. I want to encourage you as we begin this series, my, my encouragement for you, I have two things I want to uh, say to you, not just for today, but for every uh, sermon we do in the Gospel of Mark. And the first is this, I want to encourage you to not just read the text, but to imagine it. And here, here's what I mean. Uh, we, we can do something when we read the Bible that, that kind of, we, we, we read it with a distance. You know what I mean? We, we read it at a distance, and we read it as if it's some, um, I don't know, cold and flat uh, tale, and we just kind of read through it, and we move on to see what someone's going to say about it. But I want to encourage you, as we read this gospel, to try to imagine yourself there, to place yourself in the story, to see the characters, to see the setting, to, to, to even feel as best you can the environment, the same way you would if you were reading a novel or a story. You might immerse yourself in that story. I want to encourage you to do that with this story from the Gospel of Mark. It's written as a story, and so imagine yourself in it. And the second thing I want to encourage you to do is not just to hear about Jesus, but I want to encourage you to see Jesus for yourself. The whole point of this gospel, as we'll see today, is that we might see Jesus clearly. And I'm going to tell you a bunch of stuff about Jesus, but none of that really matters. What ultimately matters is you encountering the living God in flesh, Jesus Christ. And he is the centerpiece of this story, and so I want to encourage you to see him clearly. And that means maybe setting aside preconceived notions you have about him, what you expect Jesus to be like or what you expect he might say or do. And instead, see what does he really say? What does he really do? What's he really like? How does he actually interact with people? And I want you guys to get a picture of who Jesus is. That's the goal of this entire series, that we might see Christ truly and clearly the way the Bible intends for us to see him. Can you guys do that for me? You guys on board? All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. I want to encourage you also, we're going to work through this text. If you, if you have your Bible, I would encourage you to, to work through this with your Bible open or your Bible app open. However you read the scriptures, uh, follow along. I may uh, reference some other texts uh, that you may want to flip through, and it'll be helpful to kind of see those things um, in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, grab me after the service. I'll get you one. No problem. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure you have one. Okay? 
All right, that's enough on the introduction to the book of Mark. This, uh, this story, what we're going to do, we're going to do verses 1 through 13 this morning. And what we have in our text today is basically an introduction of the characters of this story. Every good story, every good movie, every good show, they start by introducing the characters. You meet them in their varying um, places and you kind of get a feel for who they are. I think about uh, maybe th- what are some of great movies or shows where there have been character introductions, right? I was thinking about Seinfeld. Has anybody seen Seinfeld? It's been out for like 20 years, so you've probably seen it by now, right? Uh, I think about Kramer. Kramer's very first introduction into that show is so ridiculous, which sets the stage for every interaction Kramer has the rest of the show. Totally ridiculous. In, in the first episode, he shows up at Jerry's apartment at 1 a.m., uh, he doesn't burst through the door, surprisingly, but he comes through the door at 1 a.m. He ruins a show that Jerry is watching by telling him the ending before, uh, before Jerry is able to finish it. And then he's standing there in his bathrobe, of course, that makes sense. And then he reaches into the pockets of his bathrobe and he pulls out two slices of bread. And he goes, do you got any meat? And that's how we meet Kramer in the story. He immediately goes from there and begins rummaging through the fridge and makes himself a sandwich. And, and by this introduction to Kramer, we now know the audience how to interact with Kramer the rest of the show, right? We know this guy is nuts, this guy is weird, this guy's going to say stuff unpredictable, and so now, anytime this character shows up, we know what to expect. What Mark is doing this morning in our text is he's introducing to us the characters of this gospel, and how he introduces them to us communicates to you and I how we ought to interact with them, how we ought to respond to them. So... Without further ado, let's read Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. It says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance For the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. As he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And after a voice, uh, and a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you sent him in the flesh, born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, and then die, and then rise again, all for us. Lord, as we begin our study of this gospel, would you encourage us with it? Lord, would you help us to see you clearly? Would we see Jesus clearly? And then, God, would you help us to respond appropriately to your Son sent for us? Guide our time this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Three characters we get to see here, right? We get to see first John the Baptist shows up, and we get this this fascinating picture of this really strange guy uh, in, the, in the wilderness, John the Baptist. Then we see Jesus, uh, we see the Son of God show up, uh, and then we see Satan, the, the enemy. And this, this kind of makes sense, right? This is every, every good story, every great movie or every good book you have has a main character, the hero of the story, certainly, and so that's going to be Jesus, spoiler alert, in this uh, story, is Jesus the hero of the story? But there's always got to be an enemy, right? There's got to be somebody uh, trying to foil the plans of the hero, and that's where Satan comes in. And every uh, good hero always has a sidekick, right? A little a helper. Uh, and so John the Baptist gets to serve that role in our, in our story. And so we're going to look at each one of those and then see uh, what we may need to do in response uh, to this Jesus, okay? First, the messenger, John the Baptist. 
This, this text, our, our, our book, it begins with one of the very few Old Testament quotations that you're going to find in the Gospel of Mark. And Mark points back to the prophets. And he says, hey, behold, I'm sending my messenger before your face who's going to prepare your way. And this is John the Baptist's purpose. This is his mission was to prepare the way for Jesus, to kind of till the ground in advance of Jesus' coming. And this is something that the people of Israel, the Jewish people, would have been expecting. They were looking forward to John the Baptist coming, but they didn't quite know who he would be. In fact, the, the rabbis at the time, uh, before Jesus, they expected it to be Elijah that would show up. They, they thought Elijah was going to be the prophet that fulfills this, this passage here. A fun, just interesting fact. I think it's interesting. You may not. That's okay. Uh, but this passage here in verses 2 and 3 is actually a, a mashup of three different Old Testament prophecies. It's not just one clean verse from Isaiah. Uh, it's, uh, it's, two from, it's one from Exodus, one from Malachi, and then one from Isaiah that are all kind of mashed up. And the, the rabbis at the time had done this already. This is not Mark like getting his quotations confused. The rabbis at the time had said, hey, these passages, these prophecies, they point to this Messiah that's going to come and the prophet that's going to proclaim his coming. If you know your Old Testament, you know there was a, a prophet of Israel named Elijah who didn't die. He had the unique um, privilege of not dying on this earth. Instead, the Lord just caught him up into heaven, right? And so because of that, the Jewish people expect, well, he's not dead, so he can come back. And so they expected this prophet to be Elijah and that he would come and prepare the way for the king, for the Messiah, uh, to do his thing. There's much that can be said about Elijah. He's going to show up a lot in the Gospel of Mark. Interestingly enough, he, he gets mentioned in chapter 6 and chapter 8. Um, he actually shows up in chapter 9, which is crazy. Uh, and then they talk about him again in, in chapter 15. And so we'll, we'll look at Elijah later. But John is not Elijah. He gets confused for Elijah, but he's not Elijah. You'll remember from our, our time in, in our Advent series where we studied the Gospel of Luke that John the Baptist is actually Jesus' cousin. They're, they're relatives. They're related. Uh, but they've taken two different paths, right? And this, this happens in families sometimes. Jesus appears to be wearing normal clothes, doing a normal job. Uh, and John the Baptist is wearing camel hair and eating locusts. And so, you know, sometimes family members go weird, right? We've all got one like that. If you're thinking, I don't have one like that, you're the one. <laughs> Sorry to inform you. I think the reason I was thinking of Kramer this morning is because John the Baptist kind of feels like he has a Kramer vibe to him, just an eccentric guy who's out there and just a little bit different, and he's, he's preaching. He's preaching out in this, this wilderness area in between Galilee and the Dead Sea, kind of along the Jordan. And he's preaching, and he's calling people to repent. He's saying, hey, you've got to turn from your old way of living, and you've got to, you've got to clean your act up. You've got to turn from your sin and do that. And he was offering them as a way to symbolize their repentance, baptism, this immersion in water, this dipping them into the Jerusalem, I mean, into the Jordan River, and then sending them back on their way to live a new life. John's ministry is to kind of prepare people for Jesus. Nobody is getting saved or putting their faith in Christ because of John. John is just tilling the ground so that when Jesus shows up and his message goes forth, they're ready to receive it. And this is how God works still today, you'll find. God, uh, a lot of times you'll find that people that put their faith in Jesus, sometimes God just radically saves them in a moment. Like they're not even thinking about spiritual things, and then God shows up in their lives and totally transforms them, and in an instant, their whole life changes. That happens. But I've found that more often than not, it's a process, isn't it? There's, there's this kind of a, maybe there's a distance from God and, and a, and a, and a disinterest in spiritual things, but then maybe something happens in life or tragedy strikes or question comes up and it makes you begin to investigate a little bit this religion thing. Or maybe they have a conversation with someone who tells them about their faith in Jesus and it makes them interested. Well, I'm not just interested in religion in general. I'm kind of interested in Christianity specifically. Can you tell me more about that? And then maybe they get an invite to church, and so they show up to a church service, and they hear a sermon about Jesus, and they go, man, this Jesus guy seems interesting. And so they go home, and they begin reading the Bible, or, or, or they begin uh, watching videos online, and they begin to investigate Jesus even more. And there's this progression until one day, eventually, it clicks. And Jesus gets a hold of their heart, and they say, you know what? I believe this is true. I'm going to put my faith in Jesus for salvation. Maybe that's your story. 
I want to encourage you with that fact. A, a lot of us, if you're here in the room, if you're a believer in Christ, you're a follower of Jesus, you know that your job is to tell other people about Jesus and to point other people to Christ, right? Sometimes we get discouraged in that, don't we? Can I get an amen? It gets discouraging if we take a step of faith and we share Jesus with someone and nothing happens. So we see. Nothing happens. It's like, huh. Or maybe we do it again with someone else and they don't put their faith in Jesus. It can be discouraging. I want to encourage you that God works on his own timeline. And you never know what part of the journey the person you're sharing with is on. You may be the moment before the moment that God uses to prepare someone's heart to put their faith in Jesus. You may be the John the Baptist, so to speak, in their life who tills the ground so that when the gospel is planted, it's planted in good soil and bears fruit. I want to encourage you to be faithful to continue to point people to Jesus because you never know where someone's at on their journey. So this messenger, he's John, he's paving the way for Jesus. He says, I'm not worthy. He's, he's making sure to deflect the praise. He says, I'm not worthy to tie this guy's sandals. Like this guy, Jesus, that you're looking for, he is it. I'm not it. And then he says, look to him. Look to Jesus. He's the real deal. He's the Messiah. And then Jesus shows up. Roman, or Mark chapter uh, 1, verse 9, it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven and said, You are my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. So Jesus, John the Baptist is paving the way, John the Baptist is tilling the soil, and then Jesus shows up. This is such an interesting um, situation. It's like, why, why on earth would Jesus go and be baptized by John, right? Have you ever wondered that? Why would he allow John to be baptized? John's saying, hey, you sinners, this is John's message. You sinners, you guys need to stop it. And to show that you're going to stop it, I'm gonna, we're going to be baptized, and that's going to be your mark of repentance. Well, Jesus is not a sinner. Jesus doesn't have anything to repent of. Jesus has never done anything wrong. And so why would Jesus go and allow John to baptize him. At first it's confusing, but if you give it a little bit of thought, it makes sense. This word, baptizo, it's a very complicated Greek word. You can, I know it's hard to see how we got from baptizo to baptism, but we did. It just means to immerse or to dip or to submerge. It's a, it's a cleansing motion. It's a, it's, a, it's a going down and then coming up, right? And so that's what happens in the Jordan River is, is the, the, the John's baptizing people and he's pushing them under the water and then pulling them back up from the water. Romans chapter 6 explains to us what baptism is meant to symbolize. It says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Did you catch that, Romans 6? He says our, our baptism is meant to symbolize our death and resurrection. This is a story where we're introducing characters, and now we are doing some foreshadowing too, aren't we? What has Jesus come to do but to be buried and to be raised again for us. Not only that, Jesus is identifying with us as sinners. Jesus is saying, hey, listen, I'm going to take on the sins of these people. Even though I don't have anything to repent of, even though I don't have anything to be cleansed of, I'm still going to go through this ritual because I am identifying myself with the sinners who do have sin. Jesus' baptism shows that he is not just God. Verse 1 says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, but he is also man. He is both. He is carrying both identities for us simultaneously, fully God and fully man. What's amazing about Jesus' baptism is just as he's taking steps to show us that he's one of us by being baptized, God is also taking steps to make sure that the Father and the Spirit are saying, hey, he's one of us too, right? They speak down from heaven. It says, a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. And in this moment, we get this really unique picture of the triune God, the Trinity. At one time, we see all three persons of the Trinity 
in this moment. We see God speaking from heaven, God the Father. We see the Son, Jesus, in the waters of baptism, and we see the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. The Trinity in one image. I wish we had time to go into the Trinity, but we don't. We'll come back to that later. But just a beautiful mystery, something that if anyone tries to explain, I promise you they'll mess it up. But we as Christians serve a triune God. One God who is perfectly whole, but is also has three distinct persons that make up this Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit. And they are here in this moment communicating Jesus is the Son of God, like verse 1 says. So we have the messenger, we have John, we have the hero, the Son of God, Jesus, And then finally, the enemy. If this was the introduction of characters, right, there's going to be some dark music playing when we get to verse uh, 12 here, right? Things are getting sinister. You're starting to see the conflict brewing. Every story needs a villain, and this villain, Satan, stands in opposition to God's plan for Jesus. There is a plan. This is not an accident. And this story has an arc that ends with Jesus winning, but Satan stands in the way. Satan tempts Jesus. You get a more full account of this temptation in the Gospel of Matthew, and you you read of kind of three hallmark or or cornerstone temptations that Jesus faces. But really, the text indicates that the full 40 days that Jesus is in the wilderness are all a period of tempting and testing. This is not, uh, these are short verses, just two verses here. It can be tempting to throw them away or not think they're significant, but this matters a great deal. Because if Jesus doesn't pass this test, then everything else written in the Gospel of Mark doesn't matter. Jesus is going to face temptation. Hebrews says that Jesus was tempted in every way that we are, yet without sin. He passes this test. The trajectory of this story is one that takes us, like I've said, from Galilee to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, Jesus is going to be offered up on a cross for our sins. He's going to die in your place and in mine on a cross for sin. And then he's going to be raised from the dead three days later, demonstrating final victory over Satan, sin, and death. But Jesus' blood does not cover our sins if Jesus isn't perfect. So Jesus has to pay a perfect price for our sins, but in order for his price to be valuable, in order for his sacrifice to be worth anything to us, Jesus has to be perfect. And so Jesus faces this temptation with Satan, and he withstands the temptation, and he leaves those 40 days unscathed, and then he continues on in his ministry for the next three years unscathed by sin. Not a single impure thought, not a single white lie, not a single uh, outburst in anger, but perfectly living as a human being the way you and I are meant to live. And so Jesus is confirmed to be who verse 1 says he is, the Son of God, it says in verse 1. He's confirmed to be that Son of God because the messenger that God promised to send says so. He's confirmed to be the Son of God because God spoke from heaven and said so. He's confirmed to be the Son of God because the Spirit descends on him from heaven and only on him at this time. He's confirmed to be the Son of God because he stands up against an enemy that no human being has ever been able to to be victorious over, and he wins. As each character is introduced, we learn that Jesus really is who he says he is, the Son of God. Knowing this determines how we respond to Jesus. Anybody ever watch Undercover Boss? Anybody seen this show? I, guilty pleasure of mine. I enjoy it every once in a while. Somebody will post clips on it online, especially I'll watch. The premise of the show is pretty simple is a a CEO or owner of a company will go undercover to the front lines of their business, right? And so if this CEO owns a fast food restaurant, uh, he'll put on a disguise, put on a costume. And let me tell you, the costume work is atrocious on this show. I mean, it's some of the worst makeup and hair you have ever seen. I don't know how anybody falls for it. In fact, one episode uh, they didn't fall for, they're like, oh, you're the CEO wearing a bad mustache. That's weird. And it just happens. Anyways, so the CEO goes undercover at these, at these restaurants or these companies that they own, and they work with their kind of frontline employees to see how things are really going, right? 
And, and the whole premise of the show, the entertainment value of it, is that people act differently when, the CEO, when they don't realize the CEO is around. And so they, you get some really cool stories of people who are just great people, who work hard, who do the right thing, who look out for one another. And, and at the end of the show, when the big reveal happens, they usually get rewarded with some kind of either a scholarship or a gift of some kind. But the more fun are the people who are terrible when they don't realize the CEO is around, right? One, one episode, there's a, uh, the owner of this chain of gyms, uh, of workout facilities, uh, their, their frontline manager, they're kind of the person who stands at the um, desk and greets uh, customers when they come in is just the meanest person you've ever seen, which is exactly what you want in customer service, right? Someone who just hates to be there waiting on people. I feel like we get that a lot these days. But anyways, that's another thing. She's terrible. She's mean. She's sarcastic. She uses foul language. She's rude to customers. I mean, it's just a train wreck. And you're watching this going, oh, man, she's going to get it. And usually when there's a reveal of the CEO after something like this happens, there's all this remorse. And they're like, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. Give me a second chance. This one was different. This lady, after being filmed for like two days, being the worst person on earth, Tried to deny it. No, I wasn't rude. I don't know what you're talking about. You're cr- No, no, I'm always nice. I'm always happy. I'm always in a good mood. And this is the most awkward interaction ever that ultimately ends with her being fired, and, which is great. You just love it. It's a, you're, you're cheering for the CEO <laughs> at the end of it. You usually don't cheer for people to be fired, and this show is like, yeah, get her out of here. The whole premise of this show, though, is built on the idea that when you know who you're interacting with, it changes how you interact with them, right? The point of this section of the Gospel of Mark is that we might know who we're interacting with the rest of the story. He says it from day one, from the very first verse, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, who? The Son of God. And so we are meant to read the rest of this story going, this is the Son of God. And then we're supposed to go, how do I respond to him? How does knowing that Jesus isn't just some prophet, isn't just some good teacher, isn't just some nice rabbi, how, do, how is knowing that he is the son of God going to change how I respond to him? So the question then before us this morning as we close is this, if Jesus is Lord, so what? What does that mean for you and for me? We're starting a new year. I would imagine you have made some resolutions. I would imagine some of them are already off the rails, and that's fine. But we all have this desire to to be different, to be better, to grow, to change in some way. And I want to submit to you this morning the best resolution that you can make is to recognize that Jesus is the Son of God and respond to him appropriately. This text we've read this morning, these first 13 verses, they're the introduction to this story. We get a title page in verse 1, and then we get the introduction of characters in verses 2 through 13. Next week in verse 14, Jesus is going to begin his ministry, and we'll follow along with him. But in this introduction to the story, this story begins, and then it has a, an arc to it, and the story has an ending as well. And Mark has one of the u- most unique endings has probably the most unique ending of all of the Gospels in that it ends very abruptly. In the Gospel of Mark, the way it ends is we're just left with Jesus rising from the dead and then he just cuts it off. Like that's kind of the end. There's no commentary about what you should do with that information. There's no instructions about, you know, going and making disciples. There's no, the, the, all of that stuff is absent from the end of Mark's Gospel. Why? Because you and I get to determine the ending for the story for ourselves. What will we do with this Jesus, who is in verse 1 is told to be the Son of God, and in chapter 16 rises from the dead, again, proving he's the Son of God? What will you and I do with Jesus? If you're not a Christian here, you haven't put your faith in Jesus, I want to tell you, you have two choices for what you can do with this story. You can believe it, and that's option A. You can believe that what Mark has said about Jesus is true, that Jesus really does live this perfect life, and not only does he live a perfect life, but he lived it for you and for me. And you can believe that when he hung on a cross, he did it for you, and that the blood that was shed covers your sin, freeing you from the penalty of your sin, of the things you've done wrong, the ways you've harmed God, the way you've done your own thing, rebelled against God. It pays the price for those things. And it restores the relationship 
between you and God that was broken. You can believe that's true. And you can believe that when Jesus rose from the dead, he overcame Satan once and for all, not just a little trial like we have here in verse 11 and 12, but truly defeated Satan once and for all. And you can believe what Jesus says in this gospel that what he's calling you to do is just to put your faith in him. You can believe all of those things. And in so doing, you can secure heaven for yourself. You can secure freedom from sin for yourself. You can secure payment for your sin for yourself. That's option A. Option B, you can reject it. That's a choice that you have that you can make. You can turn from this and you say, I think it's just a fairy tale, not history. It's not for me. I don't think it's the case. That's an option for you as well. The consequence for that decision is choosing to face God by yourself and answer for your sins, answer for what you've done wrong. I think all of us probably agree that none of us are perfect. Can I get an amen for none of us are perfect? We can also, I'm here to tell you that there is a God and he's a God of justice. Like he doesn't leave wrongs unpunished. And so if you get to the end of your life, and you've got things you've done wrong, you will stand before God, and if you have rejected Jesus, you get to answer for those wrongs yourself. And i got to tell you, it is a terrifying thing, the Bible says, to fall into the hands of the Lord. He must punish sin. He will punish sin. And if you don't allow Jesus to take the punishment for you, then you'll have to take it for yourself. And that punishment is an eternity separated from God, paying the price for sins committed and against an eternal God. I want to tell you today, there's no better decision you can make at the beginning of the year to make your life better, to change things, to be a better person than to put your faith in Jesus for salvation. I want to beg you to do it. As someone uh, who's given his life to, to proclaiming this message, to preaching this Jesus, the book of Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul says he's like an ambassador pleading with you on behalf of Jesus, be reconciled to God. You can be reconciled to God this morning. All it takes is putting your faith in Christ. For those of us that are believers here, though, what does it mean for us today that Jesus is the Son of God? Well, I think it means that everything he says can be trusted. On his journey to the cross, Jesus taught us what life in his coming kingdom is meant to look like. He teaches us about an upside-down life, right, where, where humble people are who gets exalted, where people who are mourn are people who get to rejoice, where people who, uh, who serve are the ones who are the leaders. He tells us about a life of faith, about a life of sacrifice, about a life of submission. Jesus promises us that following him is the path to real life and to real joy. He tells us that living the way God has called us to live is the best way to live, not just because God said so, but because God loves us and he wants what's best for us and he's given us a roadmap for how to live. And so I wonder, this New Year's, is there an area in your life that isn't in conformity to God's will for you, for what Jesus says how you ought to live? Is there, is there ways in which your life is out of step with what God desires for you? Maybe your marriage needs work this year and you're going, I need to, I need to level up in that department. Perhaps you're parenting. You want to be more Christ-like in your parenting. You need help in that area. Perhaps in the area of holiness in your life that's, that's, that you haven't submitted to God, you continue to live in rebellion against God's design just because you're not willing to change. Something like alcohol or your language or the entertainment you choose or the relationships you keep. They're out of step with what God has for your life. Can I tell you this morning that if Jesus really is the Son of God, the way he asks you to live, the way he tells you to live, is the best way. He doesn't call you to cast aside these sinful behaviors just so he can say, got them, ah, I made their life miserable. He does it because he loves you. And he wants you to live a life of joy, and a life of peace, and a life that honors him. If Jesus really is Lord, if we really have put our faith in him for salvation, then we'll show it by conforming our lives to his design. And so as we close, here's my one question for you this morning, is how is God calling you to respond to the fact that Jesus is Lord? What does it mean for you today? How should it impact how you live tomorrow that Jesus really is God? Not some teacher, not some nice rabbi, not some guy with some pithy sayings, but God in the flesh who died on a cross for your sins and rose again. 
How do you respond to that? I'm going to close this in prayer. The band's going to come up, and I want to give you guys some space to, to do that. I want, we're, we're going to have uh, Pastor Matt and I will be up here. We'd love to pray with you. If you have a specific area that you need help in, that you need prayer for, we would love to pray with you for that. If you want to put your faith in Jesus for the very first time, no better place than right here. We'd love to do that with you. Perhaps you've got somebody in your life who needs Jesus and you want us to pray for them. We'd love to do that as well. Or perhaps you just want to pray by yourself. You come to, uh, some, there's something about taking a step forward. There's nothing magical about this stage. I can promise you it's not made with like wood from the Holy Land or something. It's just plywood from, from Lowe's. It's fine. It's nice wood, but it's not special. Nothing magical about coming forward. But there is sometimes something powerful about taking a step in response. You're almost telling your own Self, hey, we're doing this. We're moving forward in our faith. So I want to encourage you to come and pray during this last song that we might respond appropriately to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we love you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the first word in our text today that's gospel, that's good news, that Jesus not only has come, but he's lived a perfect life and he's died and he's risen again. Just as we sang in the beginning of this service, his resurrection, that's the reason we're here. Lord, I pray that you would save this morning. If there's someone within the sound of my voice who hasn't put their faith in you for salvation, Lord, would you have them do it right now? Turn from their sin and said, say, Lord, you take it. I can't do it. Those for, for those here who are looking for a fresh start, who need to grow in their faith, who need to move forward in an area of their life. Lord, would you help us to take a step forward in our faith today? Would you help us to respond to the fact that you are the Son of God who came to save sinners? So we love you, Lord, and we worship you now in Christ's name.